I'm Stuart Hameroff. I'm an anesthesiologist. I study consciousness uh, through how anesthesia works, through quantum effects in microtubules, and a general philosophical approach. Well, non-duality is uh, the absence of dualism, and there are many dualisms uh, in, in our perceptions of the world. One of them is mind and matter, matter being the brain, and the question is how does the brain material, a piece of meat, really produce conscious experience in all its wonder, glory, and sometimes pain and boredom. But how do we have any experience whatsoever uh, coming out of this tissue, this organ? Most people view it as a computer in which neurons fire and uh, resulting in patterns, activation patterns, and this some, somehow represents uh, the outside world and the inner world, and somehow that becomes conscious and aware. But how that last step, how conscious, conscious awareness occurs, is really mysterious and unknown. Some people attempt to uh, explain this by making connection between brain processes and the fundamental level of the universe, saying that the precursors of conscious experience, what gives color, what gives sensations, feelings, and so forth, are actually intrinsic and irreducible components of the universe, something like spin mass or charge on an electron, for example, actually intrinsic and inherent to the universe. If you, if you make this leap, make this connection between the brain and the fundamental level of the universe, that actually opens the door for spirituality. And I think a lot of non-duality has to do with, uh, non-dual thinking has to do with connecting to some sort of cosmic wisdom. Uh, now, I've, I've discovered in this conference that there are other components of non-dualism. Uh, some, some within non-dualism uh, believe that uh, there is a common underlying entity, but it's nothingness. There's no meaning, there's no purpose, and this is somewhat uh, postmodern. Uh, so I think there's non-dualists non who are spiritual and believe in underlying meaning, and there are non-dualists who are not, who are somewhat uh, nihilistic or, uh, or uh, believe in nothingness and, and meaning without a real purpose except what, what we construct ourselves. So there's the schism within non-dualism, and there's also a schism between in science in these two views, between classical and, and quantum, for example. If you stay strictly classical, then there is no possibility of a connection to a deeper level, and there's no uh, real, level, real sense of uh, uh, purpose or meaning in the world. But if you take a quantum uh, approach, then and, and, and uh, take, for example, the Penrose idea that there's platonic values embedded in the universe, then you can have spirituality. So I think there's a, a dualism within science and there's a dualism within non-dualism. And two, two of these areas, the quantum approach in, in science and the spiritual approach in non-dual uh, wisdom are actually very similar. And the, the uh, sort of nihilistic uh, non-dualist and the classical uh, scientists are, are together uh, in, in a sense of sort of uh, no real meaning uh, embedded in the universe. So that's what I've learned out of, out of being here, seeing the, the division. I've known about the division in science, but I was uh, only able to appreciate the division in, in non-dual uh, wisdom here at this conference. The I in uh, neuroscience uh, and consciousness studies generally implies the ego-based, egocentric self uh, in consciousness. And we know that meditators try to lose the I, lose the self, uh, go into a state of meditation where the I dissolves, the ego dissolves, and they're in a state of pure uh, sensory input or pure inner, inner space, pure experience and so forth. And so we can get rid of the I. And, and some people say the eye does not exist. In fact, it's just a construction, an artifact of neural processes. And um, that, may not, that may or may not be true. I think in, in, in some uh, conscious states, uh, we need the eye when we're, we're paying attention, for example, dri driving a car through uh, heavy traffic. And in other cases, we relax and, and it, we don't need it. It can dissolve. And I think both of those states uh, have corresponding uh, uh, neurological states in the brain. And, in, and um, we can have a distributed sense of consciousness without the I, and we can have a sort of ego, egocentric, uh, focused uh, sense of I in consciousness. So in my view, uh, the I can be uh, real and the I, and the I can, can dissolve. Now, one aspect of this that, that's rather interesting is that when does the I occur? When does conscious awareness occur? Neuroscience tells us that if, if your brain is, is perceiving something, and you respond to that. Let's say you're talking to someone at a cocktail party with a rapid-fire conversation, 
and uh, you're processing what they're saying, and then you're responding to them. Now, if you measure the activity in your brain that is, is representing what that person is saying, it happens after you've already responded to them. And uh, this is a well-known fact in neuroscience, and it's taken to imply that we respond unconsciously and have a false illusion that we are responding consciously. When in fact, according to this view, consciousness in the eye is epiphenomenal. It's happening after the fact and has no real causal efficacy. It doesn't really do anything. It's kind of trailing along like, like uh, steam from a steam engine or smoke off the wheels of a train as uh, metaphors that were used uh, centuries ago. And we really have no control over, conscious control over our real-time activities. And we construct this illusion after the fact that, that the I was in charge and the I did this and so forth. And that is the sort of the party line in neuroscience because of the recordings of this sort. And it's also the party line in the sort of nihilistic branch of, of non-duality. Now, the way around this potentially is with quantum mechanics because if there are quantum processes going on in the brain, then we have this uh, funny thing about backward time referral, which was shown by, by Libet, to actually occur in the brain, which means that quantum information, uh, including conscious experience, can be referred backward in time to give a conscious sense of, uh, not a conscious sense, but actually conscious control in real time. So the I is not epiphenomenal. The I is a real thing, and we do have something like free will and causal efficacy in the world. But to do that, you need quantum mechanics. Well, Libet did these experiments that showed that, that uh, sensory processing, uh, you require about a half, a half a second, which is a long time of sensory processing, to, uh, to reach what he called neuronal adequacy, enough neural activity for consciousness. But that is referred backward in time to an earlier point when, uh, say, 30 milliseconds uh, uh, after impingement on the sense organs, so that uh, we have this sensation that consciousness is happening at the time of the evoked potential, early on, almost immediately. And, but this requires this funny backward time, re time referral. Uh, he reported it as an empirical fact from his experiments, and then the philosophers and the neuroscientists kind of berated him and beat him, uh, not literally, but beat on him for, for years and years and years. So he sort of changed it to him and said, well, it's not really backward effects, it's sort of an illusion. But I think if you look at the data, it really is a backward time effect. The only way this is explainable is through quantum physics. In quantum physics, there's no time, really. It's a timelessness, uh, which is uh, another similarity to the non-dual state. There's, there's no... There's no forward flow of time. Uh, there's just timeless, timelessness. And in quantum f physics, that's the case. And in quantum entanglement, the best explanation for quantum entanglement is that information is referred backward in time. And another approach is that whenever there's a quantum state reduction, there's quantum information sent backwards in time. So backwards in time is not a problem if you have quantum physics in the brain. And uh, there's other evidence for quantum physics in the brain, but if that is the case, then it will rescue consciousness from the unfortunate situation of being epiphenomenal and pretty much useless, kind of along for the ride. It, it, it uh, avoids the situation where everything is an illusion and, uh, and we're just um, you know, epiphenomenal and illusory, which is not a very complimentary thing to say about ourselves. And, but, uh, and, but although some people are perfectly happy with that, um, but I think to get around it, to, 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 to rescue consciousness from the situation, you need quantum physics in the brain. I think we should make a distinction between consciousness and self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is kind of the I, the ego-based. I think babies are highly conscious. In fact, uh, there was a speaker at the last Tucson conference suggesting that babies are more conscious. Um, and, but they don't have a self-consciousness, but they are e even more aware of their surroundings than are we. And that could be true. Uh, they just lack self-consciousness. So I think this speaks to the, uh, uh, to the distinction between an ego-based self-consciousness and just pure consciousness. I'd say babies are more like the non-dual state where, you know, you, you just uh, are at one with your surroundings without worrying about you being you or I being I. So I think babies are, are highly conscious, actually. And I think uh, um, what might go, you know, what might be conscious that, that uh, leaves us when we die uh, can stay together to some, to some extent or be distributed and, and become part of a, a more unified uh, or a more generalized distributed uh, consciousness throughout the universe. I mean, I don't, I don't know, obviously, but it's interesting to think about these things.
The big question is why is there anything? Much less why is there consciousness? Why is there brains? And uh, you know, the Big Bang is the story. And um, if it's true that consciousness is a fundamental, irreducible component of the universe, it makes it, uh, it it's still a mystery, but no less a mystery, no more mystery than why is there spin, charge, or mass? Why is there anything? And uh, Penrose took the step of saying that in fundamental space-time geometry, the stuff of which the universe is made, at a scale way below the size of atoms. Most of atoms are mostly empty space. If you go down in scale below atoms and, and shrunk down to the infinitesimally tiny Planck scale, 25 orders of magnitude below that of atoms, you would get, uh, you would see sort of nothingness on the way down, smooth, uh, featureless uh, nothingness. But then, finally, you come to the basement level of the universe where there is this information, where there is coarse irregularity, patterns, and the patterns are not random, but have information, according to Penrose, which includes mathematical truth, the laws of science, ethical and aesthetic values, and snippets of consciousness. And even though it's at this inf incredibly tiny scale, it's fractal and holographic and reproduces spatially and temporally, and it's everywhere. Wherever you go, there it is. And the idea in the Penrose Hameroff theory, for example, is that our brains access this fundamental level and can extract um, um, features of consciousness to put together uh, a complex portrait like an, like an artist might uh, have a palette of fundamental uh, qualia and take a dab of this, a dab of this, of that to make a, a complex uh, uh, conscious painting in, in our heads, which has the intrinsic uh, um, awareness within it. And it also means that our choices can be influenced by um, aesthetic and ethical values embedded in fundamental space-time geometry. And, the, and this could be, have a spiritual connotation in, it, in, in that it implies uh, we're being influenced by these platonic values, uh, following the way of the Tao or having divine guidance or whatever uh, you know, spiritual or religious metaphor you choose. And so it makes a potentially scientific uh, connection to the fundamental level. Now, you know, the Big Bang itself, of course, is, is uh, not totally agreed about, uh, upon by everyone, but there's an interesting theory um, during the Big Bang, there was this, as you know, a big explosion and rapid inflation of the universe. But then after a very short period of time, the rapid inflation stopped and there's been only slow expansion ever since. And this rapid inflation, it's called, uh, is, is not very well understood. An Italian physicist named Paolo Zizi made a calculation based on the Penrose uh, formulation for objective reduction, which gives rise to consciousness and which solves the problem of the collapse of the wave function. And she calculated, uh, she basically said that during this early inflation, the universe was in multiple coexisting possibilities. And at the end of inflation, reached a threshold for self-collapse or, or consciousness and had a cosmic conscious moment during the period of inflation. This has been dubbed the big wow theory during the Big Bang that the universe had a cosmic conscious moment and that our, our consciousness, to even today, is a micro, literal microcosm of the macrocosm uh, cosmic conscious moment that happened at the Big Bang. So I don't know if that's true or not. It's an interesting theory, uh, but it, it, it shows how we indeed may be connected to the universe at a very basic level. In classical physics, there's a separation. In classical uh, physics, from even starting with atoms or electrons or quarks, they're separate units that, that travel and interact in a void, in a space-time void. But in quantum physics, that's not the case. In, in quantum physics, there's no void. There's a, uh, or in, and in relativity, general relativity, there's no void but a background plenum or pattern or space-time geometry, it's called. And everything, uh, whether it's particles, atoms, quarks, uh, uh, spin, mass, charge, snippets of consciousness, eth ethical and aesthetic values are actually patterns in this fundamental level of the universe uh, at the Planck scale, fundamental space-time geometry. So in quantum physics, we're, we're not separate, we're connected. In classical physics, we are separate. So there's that distinction in science, and uh, I think there's a similar uh, distinction in the two camps in non-duality. Uh, 
an identity between an awareness omnipresent in the universe and fundamental Planck scale geometry. You could even call it Brahman uh, in both situations. And Atman would be a, a more or less uh, localized uh, uh, coalescence of one particular region, one, one particular uh, distribution or pattern in this Brahman quantum space-time geometry awareness that's everything. And uh, the indi when uh, a small region or a small a facet of it coalesces, that's an individual consciousness. But again, it, uh, it's like a ripple, ripples in a pond. The pond and the, the actual pond is fundamental space-time geometry. It's everywhere. It makes up everything. And the amazing thing is, if Penrose is right, it contains uh, platonic wisdom embedded since the Big Bang. In quantum physics, uh, Particles can be in multiple places or states at the same time. Uh, a particle can be here and here. An electron can be spin up and spin down uh, at the same time. It's the same particle. It's uh, separated in space. Now, uh, some people say that uh, this, is, this is called superposition. It's, and the evolution of these superpositions are described by a uh, quantum wave function. And why don't we see this in the real world? Well, there's the story of Schrodinger's cat where a superposition is, is amplified to a cat being both dead and alive. And uh, early quantum pioneers noticed that until a superposition was observed by a conscious human, it could remain in both possible states or multiple possible states. So they said consciousness collapses the wave function. In the Schrodinger's cat analogy, if you open the box and look at the cat, only then does it become either dead or alive. There's a problem with that because what about uh, uh, regions of the universe where there's no uh, conscious observation? What about uh, uh, isolated systems and so forth? And there's some other explanations, but that, that's one that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function, but that, that puts consciousness outside of science. Another possibility is that every superposition branches off to form a new universe, the multiple worlds hypothesis. Now, Penrose came along and said that, okay, superpositions are, light, are, are indeed separations in fundamental space-time geometry. But if you avoid decoherence and remain isolated, they will reach a threshold. And rather than branch off and form a new universe, they will, at, at a, uh, a time t, given by a very simple equation, will self-collapse to one choice or the other. And the choice of which one occurs is not random, but is influenced by this platonic uh, wisdom. And so that moment of consciousness can be include guidance or um, uh, uh, following platonic wisdom embedded in the universe. So that's a type of self-collapse of the wave function that Penrose proposed is consciousness. So that's one type of uh, collapse of the wave function in which, in which con consciousness is inherent and intrinsic uh, axiomatically. It's uh, a theoretical suggestion, but it seems to fit uh, known data. Platonic values include uh, mathematical truth. All the, uh, you know, every equation that is true uh, has some uh, representation in a, in a configuration in the geometry that makes it true. Uh, it could be good versus evil. It could be what is pleasing and what, what is unpleasing and uh, unsavory. Uh, so ethical, aesthetic uh, values, as well as uh, values related to qualia, to uh, so, uh, pinkness, blueness, goodness, uh, feeling good versus feeling bad, uh, bliss, joy, despair, envy, these could all be values embedded as some pattern in, in the universe that we connect to at various times. This solves one problem called the inverted qualia problem, which philosophers talk about. Uh, they would say, well, how do you know that what you see, Nick, is red is the same as what I see as red? Maybe what you call red is what I call green. How do we really know that? And that's a conundrum that philosophers argue about all the time. Now, this approach says that redness is an actual pattern in fundamental space-time geometry. Of course, it also corresponds with photons, particular wavelength. And so that particular pattern uh, accessed by your brain would give the same result as that particular pattern accessed by my brain. Now, subsequent to that, it's possible the wiring could be switched and we could still have an inverted qualia problem. But at least this gives the argument that potentially, at least, your redness is the same as my redness, even though I can never look inside your head and you can never look in mine. But we, we could know that, well, we, we could agree that redness is, is red and green is green, as opposed to really ha possibly having them reversed.
Most neuroscientists view the brain as 100 billion neurons with uh, synapses and switches firing 1,000 times a second, giving roughly uh, 10 to the 16th operations per second. And uh, artificial intelligence people hope to build a computer that, uh, with that much uh, capability fairly soon, 20 years, and have brain equivalent computers. But actually, I don't think that's going to work. For one reason, each neuron is incredibly complicated and is not a simple on-off switch, one or zero, but is actually uh, kind of a... Um, much more complicated. Consider a single cell, another single cell like a paramecium, which is only one cell, it has no synapses, no, it's not part of a network, and, but yet using structures called microtubules on, on, the, on its outer surface and interior, it swims around, it finds food, it avoids predators, it avoids obstacles, it can learn. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes, it, and then it, do it again, it'll escape faster and faster each time. And uh, it can find a mate, another paramecium, fuse and have sex. Uh, how does it do it? It doesn't have any synapses. It uses structures called microtubules. These, same, uh, these microtubules are, are polymers of uh, proteins which seem to act like computer switching matrices and have the potential capacity to process information inside all living cells. And um, neurons have a lot of them. And the capacity of, of a neuron uh, uh, is therefore, it's, it's a possible storage place for memory, for context, for, for processing. So, I think to understand the brain, uh, both conscious and non-conscious processing, we have to look inside the neuron to the level of the microtubules, which is a whole other level of information processing. But even that wouldn't get us consciousness. Um, even that would be just more computation, more enhanced con computation, more uh, efficient computation, but still only computation without qualia, without consciousness. And for that, I think you need the Penrose mechanism that connects us to this fundamental level of the universe. So I think the answer is in quantum computation and microtubules inside our neurons. There is this idea of a holographic universe, and that's very compatible with what I've been saying about fundamental space-time geometry, because the information, the patterns embedded in fundamental space-time geometry are fractal and holographic, so they will repeat non-locally and over scales. So wherever you go, there, there it is. And at whatever scale you are, you will get the information, the pattern, uh, without losing information, just perhaps losing a resolution if you go, uh, depending on the scale. So the quantum approach to consciousness and uh, the idea of holographic universe, which I guess is consistent with non-duality uh, teachings, are very, are very uh, comparable and, and uh, resonate with each other beautifully. I would define spirituality along three lines. An interconnectedness among living beings and the universe. Um, two, uh, the ability to be influenced or access platonic cosmic wisdom embedded in the universe, uh, divine guidance, the, the way of the Tao. And three, the possibility of conscious existence uh, outside of the body after death, even reincarnation. And all three of those are plausible, feasible with the quantum consciousness approach. Uh, interaction among people uh, by quantum entanglement, uh, interaction among people and, and the universe, even inanimate objects also through uh, entanglement, uh, influenced by, by uh, cosmic wisdom through platonic values embedded in the universe according to the, the Penrose idea. And finally, if consciousness is actually uh, occurring at the fundamental level of space-time geometry, normally in the, uh, in the microtubules in the, in the brain, when the quantum coherence driving the microtubules is lost, the heart stops, uh, whatever, then it's conceivable that the uh, quantum information isn't dissipated but, uh, or, or isn't lost, but uh, dissipates somewhat to the universe at large because the isolation mechanisms holding it in would be lost also, but stays together by entanglement. And if, a, if it's a, a patient who's had a cardiac arrest and is revived, uh, it may go back in and they had a near-death out-of-body experience. And if they die, it could exist indefinitely, it could merge with the universe at large or perhaps uh, be drawn into um, a, a cell or a fetus or a zygote in, in reincarnation according to Hindu tradition. So, you know, I can't say that any of these things occur, although I think there's evidence for entanglement among people in various uh, types of uh, paradigms. But I think uh, the quantum approach and, and the Penrose idea gives a, a plausibility argument for spirituality. Mm -hmm.